asked if I get nervous when I speak in public, and the truth is yes. When I was in college, I was giving a speech once to about 500 people. I knelt down to pick up a piece of paper, and my pants ripped out from the fly all the way to my belt loop. So I figure that tonight could not go worse. Good. So thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I've been called a lot of things lately, but a teacher role model has not been one of them. Um, I'm honored to be here tonight, and the past year and a half has been full of the most amazing moments that you can possibly imagine. I was the first special education teacher to be named Oregon's Teacher of the Year, and just one of a handful, and just one of a handful of gay people who have won this award in the past. I was able to do some amazing things. I met with Hillary Clinton. I met with President Obama. I got married, gay married. What a year. Well, you know, I just got home from Peru with the NEA Fellowship. I was one of the Global Fellows. And we have some of them here tonight. So I'm wondering if all of the Global Fellows that are in the room will stand up for a moment. Because these people are true teacher role models. While a lot of teachers were taken out last week after school got out to um, rest and put their feet up, the Global Fellows were in Peru at 11,000 feet hauling 45 pound mud bricks to build a greenhouse for an impoverished school. So I think these people deserve uh, a little bit of our uh, celebration tonight. So if you're wondering where the foundation money goes, I can at least tell you that last week they were building a greenhouse to make sure that a whole school full of children would get breakfast and lunch. So anyway, I just mentioned gay marriage and the fact that uh, the Global Fellows were in Peru when suddenly all of our Twitter feeds started going crazy. And it seems some, like some things changed here in the United States while we were gone and we completely missed it. The White House was a rainbow house. And we heard there was cheering, and parties, and parades, and quite the celebration, but we didn't see any of that. So I'm wondering if tonight, for the Global Fellows who were gone representing you, if on the count of three you'll give us a good cheer, and let us see how it felt to be here at that moment. So one, two, three. Thank you very much. We, we missed that. <clears throat> so, this award, uh, the fact that I'm here tonight speaking, um, it's very special to me. Um, I, I'm here because I stood up for my students. I didn't get it because I'm a great teacher, and I didn't come here because I did a fancy project. I got here because somebody messed with my students, and I fought back like a bear. You see, I've won a lot of awards recently, but I know better teachers than me that should have been Teacher of the Year in Oregon. I know better union members who would have made a better Global Fellow than me, but when it comes to students, there is nobody, nobody, who is a bigger and meaner bear than me when it comes to protecting them, except for maybe Lily Garcia. But I will get to that later in my speech. So to understand me, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of background. In the spring of 1980, I was listening to the B-52s and Blondie, and I just caused a campus-wide scandal by wearing a pink Izod to school. I know, it was scandalous. And my best friend told me, tearfully, that he didn't understand girls, and that they weren't for him, and he didn't want to date women, and I was cool with that. I was so cool in my pink eyes out with the collar up, my varnay sunglasses, and a big head of red feathered hair. But uh, it just made me love my friend more, and, and I understood where he was coming from. And although I didn't say it, we were in the same boat. And I gave him a big hug that day, and he headed home, and I never saw him again. And that's how I learned that LGBT youth kill themselves at three times the rate of their straight counterparts. And that's how I learned that being out is not about telling everybody that you're gay. It's about making sure that the other gay people know that they are not alone.
and that was in 1980, and it still hurts. That's the sort of broken heart that doesn't heal, and that's why I accepted my nomination for Teacher of the Year. You see, the nomination for me came eight months after a Widowmaker heart attack. The last week of school, I was having some funky feelings over here on the right side of my chest, just like I'd pulled a muscle. And I don't like missing school, so I, I stayed all week, and on that Friday, I finally drove myself to the hospital. And as I was driving at about 70 miles an hour down the freeway, that funny little pain kind of spread. The doctor told me that uh, I had massive damage to my heart, and they took me into surgery. And when I woke up, the doctor was there, and he told me this. Mr. Bigham, I had never said this before, but you just survived a Widowmaker, and there is no damage to your heart. On Sunday, with my new stint in place, I was sent home. And the nurse told me that in 12 years in cardiac ICU, she had never once sent a patient, a patient home. And I was left with this feeling that I was here for a purpose. And despite the fear that the stress of being teacher of the year might do some damage to my health, my husband Mike and I, we agreed that an open teacher of the year would send a message to gay youth. And that message is simple. You are valued. You can be respected. And most important, you are not alone. If I present, prevented one suicide with this message, it would all be worth it. And so I took that nomination to be Teacher of the Year. And last January, my first month as Teacher of the Year, I gave a speech. And in it, I said, 10 months ago, my partner might have been a widower. But instead, here I am, one of the first openly gay teachers to be Teacher of the Year. And just my being here sends a message to gay youth that it gets better and better. Well, my supervisor took offense at that. She told me to stop saying I was gay or someone was going to shoot me in the head. When I refused, I was given a written order that all speeches and all writings, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, must be approved by my district in advance. I was told I was being moved to a new grade level and that my staff would be changed. And a few weeks later, I was at the White House for our honor ceremony, and when the White House press corps asked if there was a teacher who would like to make a statement, I thought about the orders from my district. They were already after me. If I spoke up, it would be a declaration of war. If I didn't speak up, how could I ever hope to stop some of those teen suicides? So I did what every single one of you would have done. Sorry. I put my students first. There you go. Excuse me, I said to the teacher from Georgia who was standing in front of me, but I am coming out of the closet. And I walked up to those microphones from every news agency and from every US and from every news agency from the US and abroad, and this is what I said. As one of the first openly gay teachers of the year, I am so pleased to be sending a message to our gay youth that there is a future ahead of them. 30% of all teen suicides are by gay youth, and these laws that we are passing across the states that demean gay people and make our youth feel terrible about themselves need to stop. And then I kind of stumbled blindly away from the microphone, realizing that I had just declared war. I had no plan, and no allies, and no voice because I had been ordered not to speak. But then, there came a game changer. The next night, I attended a dinner at the Institute of Peace, and one of the speakers was Lily Garcia. Do y'all know Lily? <laughs> she walked up on the stage in this beautiful bubblegum pink gown, and I thought, oh, she's adorable, she is so sweet! And then she opened her mouth. <laughs> and out came what I can only call a barn burner of a speech. Lily tore up the stage that night, and she was not very Institute of Peace-like. <laughs> she was rallying teachers to stand up to oppression and to fight for education, and she did it openly from the stage, and I thought it one of the best political speeches I have ever seen. 
seen the president speak from five feet away. I've seen Hillary Clinton speak, and let me say, they could never, ever have pulled off that bubblegum gown. <laughs> so two days later, at the Oregon RA, in defiance, I threw aside my approved speech, and I gave a speech I'd written on the plane on my way coming home. And I made it clear to my district that they would not control my speech, nor would they control me, and nor would they stop me from speaking out for gay youth. As a spokesman for the LGBT youth in my state, I knew that if they shut me up, they shut up everyone I represented, and that was unacceptable. Lily, you inspired me to put up a fight, and I want to tell you, I put up one hell of a fight. But, the retribution was swift and it was harsh. My district dismantled my classroom, it changed my staff, they boxed up my desk and all of my supplies and moved my desk and computer out of the classroom and told me I would run my medically fragile classroom from down the hallway. They started putting my students at risk, and so I filed state and federal complaints against them, and they retaliated, saying I could no longer meet with groups about gay teen suicide, or bullying, or gay student alliances at high schools, because those students offered no value to my district. So I used my personal days, I went instead. But the fight got dirty really fast. In a three week period, I was given over 30 threats of termination. Take the picture of you and the president down off of your door by 3.30 or you will be terminated. One morning at 7.55, I was given an order that if I didn't turn in a bunch of paperwork by 3, I would be terminated. My supervisor knew that I had a training with her from 8 until 3 and could not possibly do it. But, I didn't stand still and I didn't stop fighting and I did not fight alone. My Uniserv, Alan Moore, saw how my district was treating me and he threw himself between me and, the local, me and my district and the local union stood for me. Regina Norris and Hannah Vanderlake who are here tonight, they would like to stand up for a moment. They both came to my defense multiple times. They came out swinging for me. And I can tell you as Teacher of the Year, I represent 45,000 Oregon teachers. And you know why I know that number? Because I think every single one of them sent me a Facebook message or an email or a telephone call saying we are standing behind you. So Oregon, your table here and the table there and it's going on all over. Oregon, thank you so much for standing up, not just for me, but for every gay kid that I was speaking for. And they weren't the only ones. The National Network of State Teachers of the Year, they came out swinging for me. And thank you, Andy Kuhn and Sudun Eubanks, for supporting them. And also the NEA Foundation supported me, and they gave me advice and moral support. And more importantly, they treated me like I was a respected teacher, even when my district started some very nasty smear campaigns. And then the NEA LGBTQ Caucus, here tonight, they sent word that I was going to be here tonight as your keynote speaker. The same week I was fired from my job. And so much support, and not just from the union, but from my friends. Maddie Fennell is not here tonight, but Maddie Fennell sent me late night texts all the time to give me support. And I don't know how she did it. There she was, she had just missed like four flights and was driving 15 hours, had a Tic Tac for dinner, and then was still on the phone making sure that I was okay. And at first I didn't understand, but now I do. Cyborgs don't need sleep. <laughs> if you know Maddie, you know what I mean. Kristen Record for Connecticut. She became a cheerleader for me, making sure that Twitter and Facebook knew every single thing that was happening. And out of nowhere, the Badass Teachers Association inundated my district. They inundated my district with emails and tweets to the point that my district shut down their phone lines and canceled the board meeting where they were going to fire me.
And I have to talk about my union lawyer for a second because she danced rings around my district. When my district threw me out of the classroom and fired me and made international news. And with just a few emails and a one nice, nicely worded letter, my district crumbled in the face of my, the union lawyer and they had to take me back. When they announced that they were going to fire me the following month, in April, and then again in May, and again in June, she was there every step of the way saying, you want to fire him? Excellent. Let me see the documentation. And they backed down three months in a row. And finally, my district and I came to a realization that my job was not going to be there. I couldn't go back to them. They had done too much. And so I accepted the settlement and I walked away from the job. But along with that settlement came attached a gag order that I could not speak about what happened. I'd like to tell you my response to that. <laughs> it's not the one you're thinking, that's what my mom said, that they could stick it. My mom's not a lady sometimes. I told them that they would never ever control a single word out of my mouth, ever again. So instead of a gag order, they wrote me a check for $140,000. But that wasn't the end of my fight. And the only reason I took the settlement is because I was getting what I wanted. My superintendent was fired. My supervisor is gone. The city of Portland elected three new school board members last month. A fourth resigned over the pressure. And when I took the settlement, it meant that the state investigation would stop and not be released. But my district went public and said, had we continued this fight, we would have beat him in court. He is a liar. The state responded by releasing the investigation and the, and the interviews of all of my co-workers, which completely indicated what I've been saying. The headline in the papers when I left to fly here was substantial evidence of discrimination and retaliation against the Oregon Teacher of the Year was found. It's funny how life changes. Because originally I thought that my message that I would be spending, sending to gay youth was that they should hold on, that they should hang in there because it gets better. And then it became very clear to me that was not the lesson that I was here to teach. This is my message to the LGBT kids in this country. You are worth everything. You are worth my career. Sometime, someday, you're going to have to fight. And when you have to fight, you fight with everything you have. And you make sure that everybody knows that they are not the only one out there and that they are not alone. I stand with you and I will always stand for you. And with that, I thank you so much for having me here tonight. Have a terrific evening.